Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Hello, team. Before we get to today's discussion session, we have a few updates. For those who haven't heard, the Young Justice premiere will be on January 4th, 2019. As far as we can tell, they will be releasing three episodes at a time every Friday in January, with the mid-season finale being four episodes, releasing on January 25th. There's also a new trailer showing action scenes, Geoforce manifesting his powers, the other outsiders in action, and more. Leading up to the premiere, DC Universe has just announced two special events. Christopher Jones and Greg Weissman have put together the first Young Justice tie-in comics in years, which will release in two parts on January 2nd and 3rd. We're hoping the success of this comic will lead to even more comics, filling in the gaps between and even within episodes, as well as between seasons. If you haven't read the original tie-ins, they are a must-read for any Young Justice fan. And once you've devoured those, you can check out myself and Emily giving them Whelm-style deep dives here in the feed. Before that, though, starting on December 4th, DC Universe will be releasing enhanced episodes from the first two seasons of Young Justice. In these select episodes, you'll get commentary from DC Comics staff like Sam Humphreys, Bernard Chang, Mike Carlin, and James Tyne in the fourth, pop-up facts and behind-the-scenes insights, creator commentary from Greg Weissman, Brandon Vietti, and Phil Barassa, and we are excited to announce watch-along commentary from us, Emily, producer Neil, and myself. We are both honored and ecstatic to have been invited to be part of the Young Justice digital releases, and we hope you enjoy these enhanced episodes. You can check them out weekly as they lead up to the Season 3 premiere. And with all that out of the way, let's get on to our discussion. Stay whelmed, everyone, or join us in being overwhelmed. We'll leave it to you. Recognized. Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Kyle Gould, D-4-1. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Kyle Gould. Along with being the husband of What the Force podcast host and previous discussion session guest, MC Gould, Kyle is himself an actor, editor, and podcaster. You recently heard me mention him during the Batgirl Secret Origin as he swooped in to save our day, and we appreciate that, Kyle. You can find Kyle online every Wednesday as the host and Dungeon Master of the Tavern Tales Dungeons & Dragons podcast, every other Friday as Jason in the audio drama The Glass Appeal, and monthly as Xavier, the cult leader on the Black Forest podcast. If you live in or around the Calgary area, you can also find Kyle live on stage as Richard Burbage in the Morpheus Theater production of Shakespeare in Love. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm glad we could finally make this happen. I know. We've had a bit of back and forth about it. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk yeah, about that a in a minute. It's a back and forth type of, uh, type of episode <laughs> and also, a, yeah, I mean. Life. <laughs> yeah, but also the character's relevancy is kind of secondary too so other things definitely come up oh no way man i'm a red tornado fan we'll, we'll talk about that before we begin i want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to young justice including both seasons of the series so far season three coming soon the comics and the video game if you've not seen read or played all the material and are spoiler wary consider this your warning and with all that out of the way let's dive in so oh, no I, hold on before we dive in yes i also would like to make a caveat i would like to say i do not know if these statements are accurate but perhaps they are true <laughs> and if i understand the term correctly i believe i have come to care about all of this oh i love it <laughs> I love Red Tornado so much. Um, oh, man. So let's talk about you first, though. I touched on a few things in the intro, um, a few of the many things that you are involved in. But uh, tell us more about yourself and what you do out in the world. Sure. Uh, I mean, my day-to-day -day is sitting at a desk thinking about how to entertain myself until work comes in. 
And so one of the things that I entertain myself with is writing campaign modules for Dungeons and Dragons and putting together great, wonderful adventures for my friends. And now, uh, as well, memorizing lyrics and lines for live theater productions that I'm involved with in community theater here in Calgary, as well as thinking about wishing I was at home so I could take care of the two kids I've got here and help situate my wife into a better position with her own podcast as well as her own work. So I get to, I like to throw a lot of balls in the air and see how many I can keep up there. I have no idea what that's like. (laughs) Um, So you mentioned, uh, you said, uh, you know, waiting for work to come in. So you're a freelancer. What do you do? No, I work at ComputerShare. It's a stock transfer agency. Oh. And without getting into the real nitty gritty specifics, I'm in the financial industry in a real niche sector of a regulated, um, commissioned organization that publicly traded companies and most private companies have to have to keep uh, an arm's length distance with their uh, with their shareholders and my company provides services like annual general meetings dividend payments quarterly mailings things like that okay okay do you work from home or do you work from an office no i sit in the office all day every day i uh, gotcha i gotcha i gotcha um but you guys have this cool studio i'm looking at right now in your basement is that did you use that for both of you guys for both of your podcasts Yes, both of our podcasts are set up here in the basement, uh, which I renovated and developed myself over the course of two and a half years. And uh, and then when we finally had the theater room set up, which has, you know, a 22 foot long stretch, we've got the 75 inch TV behind me here. Ah, yes. On the other side, there's a raised platform with the big long couch on it. In front of it is the love seat. And we watch all of our or we would watch all of our DVDs and Blu-rays and video games down here, except I then got into podcasting, set up the tables, and now have a big recording <laughs> studio set up right in the middle where the big empty space was. So we don't watch a lot of TV in this room anymore. <laughs> right. That's funny. Well, definitely What the Force has been taking off uh, recently with uh, some pretty incredible guests, uh, including Vanessa Marshall uh, from Young Justice. So... You should definitely, if you haven't popped over to check that out yet when MC was on, please, please do that as well. I very much recommend their podcast comes out every Monday, um, pretty early in the morning. And it is uh, a very enjoyable, thought provoking podcast. Yeah. And then also Tavern Tales. (laughs) Right. There's that too. But that that's just every uh, every Wednesday comes out at 12.01 in the morning. It's been coming out for over a year. I have not missed a deadline yet. Um, uh, every month I also release my Tavern Tales Junior podcast, which is where I get my Love two it. children, 10 and 6, and their three friends who are 8, 11, and 12 to sit around a table and play Dungeons and Dragons with me. <laughs> Lots of planning there, right? Lots of narrative, lots of uh, railroading. No, no actually, what so I do much. is uh, <laughs> is pretty cool. I get them to tell me what things are like. Yep. So I, I say you walk into a room, it's a very scary room. Why is it scary? And then they all come up with the reasons as to why it's scary. <laughs> right, right. That's what we call player agency in the business, yep. right? I love it. It's fantastic. So um, so getting on, on track here with us, when did you first see Young Dutch Justice? Did you see it in the original run, DVD? Did you see it uh, digitally? No, I sat right next to my wife and we turned on Netflix in Canada here. And there it was. Um, so I think it's been a decade now that it's been out. Um, uh, and we was... saw it probably no. seven years ago. It was out... No, it would have been much earlier. It would have been much more recent than that. So the the it aired in uh, 2010, technically 2011 to 2013. So it's only been five to seven years that it came out. So it's been out recently. I think it was and and Young Justice. I don't know when it came out on in Canada on Netflix. Maybe it was earlier than us, which is certainly possible. The way that the Netflix thing is set up is so weird. It is so weird. But yeah. it has been on Netflix and it has never come off Netflix in Canada. Oh, it definitely came off for us. And then it, yeah, off and on. And then the second season took forever to come on the U.S. Netflix. But I mean, that may be, a th- like I said, it may be a thing, like different contracts in different countries. We could go into a whole thing about that, but let, let's not get derailed on that that business. Um, so what? before you watch that, though, what was your history with D.C.? Before you started watching My history with DC is only with Amalgam Comics, 
which came out in the 90s because yeah. I was a hardcore devout devotee of Marvel comics. So and Marvel know, Marvel was your comic company. Oh yeah, uh, all the time. I think I, I dabbled every now and again into an image comic line or into dimensions, but I never really left Marvel ever since I found it in you know the late 80s, early 90s. Oh, interesting. And can you, for our listeners who don't know what Amalgam is, can can you can you tell uh, people a little bit of that bite of history? Sure. So rather than provide you a history on it, I'll tell you what if Marvel and DC, Warner Brothers, decided next year to just combine efforts and release movies where they had their their own uh, their own. Um, copyrighted characters and their own intellectual property in each other's material. And they just combined efforts so that, you know, Superman and um, Captain America were in the same movie together. And this mm-hmm. was a legit thing that happened and it's canon. Yeah, That is what happened in the 90s. In the <laughs> 90s, DC and Marvel said it's the, you know, we're trying to regrow and rebuild. Let's work together for a series of 10 comic book comic books and at first it was let's have them fight each other and then it was uh, another series was also what happens if they combined together into one amalgam character so yes. captain america and superman became one individual right and it <laughs> i think it was wonder woman and storm yes and wonder like, woman and storm yeah there was a whole there's a whole list of fascinating combinations that they did over there and wasn't it wolverine and lobo i can't remember that but might have been what there was fighting wolverine and lobo and then there was there was a there was the marvel versus dc thing that they did and i think it was storm and thor or something like there was like it was it was crazy they just did so much stuff uh in the 90s trying to um trying to boost up sales and obviously cross market which in your case seems to have worked Absolutely. I mean, I've always been secondarily connected to DC because who can not growing up where we did, where we have the Flash a TV show, we have the Batman movies, yeah. and then the Batman animated TV show, and we have all of the Superman materials. And I, I mean, I watched Smallville from episode one through to the end of the season at episode, you know, 120 and or even longer in season 10 it was season 10 yeah it must have been, it was hundred must have been hundreds of episodes i haven't looked over 200 yeah. episodes yeah. yeah 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 uh crazy yeah and it's true like dc has a lot of a lot of peripheral material outside of the comics that people can get hooked onto. marvel has the movies now but when we were younger there was there was the x-men animated series and then there was like some spider-man stuff and that was Kind of about it, really. Well, there was a Captain America movie in the eighties. Let's not forget oh, well, that. No, even though well, we we're try not, so hard to. <laughs> there was also a Nick Fury one, and it was horrifying. Oh, so it's please, so please, bad. Do, so please don't go look at that. It's even earlier. It's worse. It's so bad. It's so bad. And yeah. there was uh, there was the Thor TV show. Well, there was a well, there was a Hulk. There was the Hulk TV show, and then they did these movies with Hulk, and he was like having guest stars. Like there was a Daredevil Hulk thing, and then there was Thor that was hilarious. Oh. It's just so bad. What I liked about that was that was my first introduction to Thor as a kid and realizing that you could be somebody else because here's this like old old guy, Donald Blake, walking around and then suddenly he turns into this super buff right. god. Um, <laughs> god, it was just amazing. It's so funny. Anyway, yeah, I hear what you're saying. So DC definitely had a lot of a lot of entry points, you know, with both with movies and animated uh, animated series and that kind of thing. And you and you and uh, M- like I, MC, she's so tied into mythology and um, the psychology of things and, and that kind of stuff. And you know her love for comics as well. Is this something you guys shared? I think that's what brought us together. We met in speech and debate society at the University of Calgary in two thousand and two thousand and one two thousand. Yeah. I was in my fourth year of university. She was just going into university. Right. And so the love of debate is what kindled our relationship in the first place. Her understanding of classical mythology is largely driven from her relationship with her father, who was very intellectual, very, very mm-hmm. uh, academic 
Whereas yeah. my father was very, uh, let's go out and play some sports and you're going to know every single sport known to man. And I'm going <laughs> to teach you how to play every single sport. And nice. there, there's not a sport I don't know how to play. Marie Claire is, is not a sport player. So I have not done a lot of sporting <laughs> since we got together. <laughs> I gotcha. And what about your kids? Are they sporting? I know that they're playing D and D and watching young justice, but, uh, what, what do they do? So my kids are always up for anything, but my son currently is deep into parkour, which is the art oh. of, of moving through space. Yes. Oh man. And I wish is... that was a thing when I was a kid. Oh, Could you? Im- I mean, it was a thing when we were kids. We just, we kind were also of. encouraged to have skateboards as well. Well, that's true. I guess we like, cause we would like, that's what we were we'd get to our friends' houses by cutting through people's backyards and hopping over fences and, and going over houses and doing that kind of stuff. We just didn't have a name and be like this thing you could go study. I would have totally exactly. been all over that. Or go to That's- a warehouse full of stuff that is specifically oh built for that. That's so good. <laughs> like you, like did, so you didn't fun. used to jump over the Johnson's fence because it was really, really rough on the top and you always ended up with a splinter. Right, but, right. So you'd have to cut through our kitty corner hop across the neighbors who you didn't even know who they were. Right. They were just the people that lived on the corner and didn't talk to anyone. Right, You'd have right. to jump their fence and <laughs> right. hope they weren't watching. <laughs> right, Exactly. That sounds amazing. I love it. I love it. All right. So let, let's dive into our subject here. We we hinted at it a little early on. Tornado. Red Tornado. When you and I were talking about having you on the show, you were like, I want to talk about Red Tornado. I'm like, oh, we haven't had anyone say that yet. Why yeah, Red Tornado? I always fall in love with the peripheral characters uh-huh. and kind of want to imagine them in a greater semblance of what they're presented with. Yeah. And Red Tornado is that. I keep. I wanted to ask you, like, what what is your history, if any, with Red Tornado? Is it were you? Is this your first introduction to the character of Red Tornado in Young Justice? Okay, so let's go all the way back. Mm-hmm. When I was young, one of the first costumes for Halloween that I can remember, I was the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing this coming. <laughs> I didn't, I mean, my it, my parents said, we watched it. I was like, I want to be one of the characters. My mom said, well, I've got cardboard and aluminum foil. I can do it. And yeah. so I was the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And I think that I've always been intrigued by this concept of artificial intelligence. And now where people call it sentient artificial intelligence or advanced artificial intelligence, because we already have artificial intelligence in our lives. And then, I mean, I was in grade eight and I was... I had to go to baseball practice. I did not want to go to baseball practice because baseball practice was on Thursday evenings and that's when Star Trek came on. And Uh I wanted to watch Captain Jean-Luc Picard and William Riker and my favorite character, Data, go about (laughs) their business. (laughs) So I started collecting Avengers comics not long after that because there was this character that really intrigued me Mm -hmm. in the later 90s Um, who was in love with this wild witch woman named Scarlet Witch. And she had never had control of her powers and was always making problems for everyone. But this, this character was always like true to his word. His word was his bond. He was always extremely loyal. He had a set routine of programs and parameters by which he lived by. And that was vision. So then when I see young justice, on the TV, on Netflix, I guess it wasn't that long ago, but it sure feels like forever yeah, ago. It does feel like forever ago. But I think I that's what you. kids do is that they just make the time go so much slower because you're experiencing it through them and everything's so quick for them. It's totally true. My kids are exactly the same way. I have no sense, no sense of time of when <laughs> something has happened or hasn't happened. <laughs> Especially ever since they were born. I'm like, Robin is 10. What was I doing a decade ago? That doesn't feel like a decade ago. Yeah, I know, right? It, uh, it feels like all the time and none of the time. Ex- yeah. yeah, exactly. So much of your day is full that so much of it doesn't, like, it could, more has to have happened than that. I remember I definitely my 20s was like, like a distant how much memory time, now. How much time was I wasting when I didn't have kids? Like, <laughs> I, I had a, a friend of mine who told me when, when she had kids, she said she real so after she had kids, she started appreciating her time more. And she's like, I appreciate the time that I don't have with my kids. And I appreciate the time I have with my kids. I never take time for granted, whether they're with me or not. And she said, I used to take time for granted all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that I like, I've always been struck by the love song of Jal for proof rock from T.S. Eliot. And he says, there are minutes in which a minute will reverse. And I never really understood his concept of time as we went through, as he goes through that poem, but he indicates very well that time is 
so short. A second or a minute is such a short amount of time, but so much can happen in that moment, in that minute. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got we've got a thread here. We've got vision. We've yeah. Got, and that we, leads, of course, to. <laughs> so you see so you see Red Tornado in Young Justice again, or was it maybe Justice League, the animated series or something else that you I have in? never seen Justice League, the animated series. I've oh, watched a bunch of clips so and whatnot good. over the years. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. Uh, the style of art is so retro. Yeah. Um, that you, you, I think that that might have been why I gave it a skip because Batman: The Brave and the Bold was on and had a, like a less, a more even more cartoony version than that one. So I kind of yeah. watched, yeah, that one instead. Gotcha. Well, definitely Red Tornado. So I, my history with Red Tornado goes back to when I was a kid, and he's evolved so much uh, over over time and stories that you could tell with him. I remember him being, you know, solidly in the C D string heroes of of the Justice League, and then. In the era, like in around the 2000s, right, when we're talking about the Justice League animated series, suddenly they started representing him as like this cornerstone cornerstone core member. And I'm like, oh, okay, but he doesn't, his powers don't do a lot, you know, that kind of thing. That's like my, my 10-year-old, 12-year-old me still chirping up in my head. And then he'd do stuff like, oh, no, I'm just going to remove all the air from the room. Yep. And now Superman can't breathe and is dying. And like, you know, you're like, oh, whoa, I didn't think about these other layers of his powers, you know, destroying buildings and destroying ships or destroying things by changing, you know, air pressure uh, areas inside them to have it crush itself. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, when did he become this really powerful character? And it's incredible. And having him in Young Justice was was fun. Uh, for me, because I didn't read the Young Justice comics, where he is, he appears in the comics as well. That that uh, the show takes its name from, anyway. But yeah, he, it wasn't his. It wasn't. It, he he didn't jump out at me as a character that was like my favorite. But he was always there. He was just this almost ubiquitous character, whether it was Justice Society or Justice League or Earth One, Earth Two, all these places. He was there. Yeah, he's always been there. He's always yeah. in the background um, as a secondary character, and he never really gets much vo- vocal work or screen time. <clears throat> the reason why I think is because they didn't really know what to do with his personality. I've always felt that Red Red Tornado has this great concept and he's got these interesting powers that you can play with, but they don't really do much with him as a person. And then it wasn't until recently that people started, you know, that writers actually started to investigate him a bit more and i think that has to do with the zeitgeist of artificial intelligence and robotic life having having entered into you know cultural the the cultural gap that we're in right now Mm -hmm. where people are thinking about this being a potential issue or a potential problem or a potential groundbreaking um savings for humanity yeah I think it, I think from a storytelling standpoint too. I was thinking it also has to do with the fact that superhero movies and shows and and that kind of that, that story arena. When we were a kid, you didn't watch Super Friends and see Clark Kent very much. You know, like the stories were about fighting supervillains or stopping an asteroid or you know that kind of stuff. But as things started moving forward, particularly with like Batman the animated series, and you started to be like they started to realize the audience is interested in the secret identity aspects of these characters. Though the John Smith persona of Red Tornado, this is the first time I've ever seen it in any kind of animated, like, or any kind of presentation that wasn't in the comics. So now you have a potential. You know, it's the same thing with uh, Martian Manhunter, right? We get to see John Jones, and we get to see, like, some of his personality in his apartment. And it's a, it's a very similar kind of parallel there where we actually can find out more about Red Tornado because now we we got this whole, these whole storylines here about him being a hero and why he's a hero and, and how he was created and his quote unquote yeah. siblings. And um, yeah, it's not something that, you know, a couple of decades ago, I think people who were doing animated series got as much into and now it's pretty common. Yeah. The depth of storytelling and the breadth of storytelling has sure changed and there's sure been a shift in the last decade or 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in watching Young Justice, besides this uh, fascination you have with artificial intelligence, right? What, what is it? Was there, 
was it his story arc or anything that jumped out at you? Was there something in particular that you, you that jumped out at you being unique uh, as Red Tornado, as being a Vision fan? Red Tornado and Vision have very different power sets, but there's a lot of tropes that they hit on, a lot of uh, uh, of each other. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities in their power sets too, and the ability to fly. And um, well, actually, that's the only real similarity between think, their two power I think sets that that's I can think of. Pretty much it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm thinking Vision has density control. He can become denser and more strong. He can walk through walls, and he's got that yeah. beam that comes out of the. So the, the gem, not, is, the gem in his eye. Yeah. yeah, the solar gem in the movie. It's a the mind gem. Yeah, I really quite liked that in the in the EU for for Marvel MCU. Yeah, I like the way that they incorporate a lot of that stuff because I think that particular gem was owned by God. Who was that? Adam Warlock, I think, which isn't even a character in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe yet. So one of the I, I think he is actually him. at the end of. Oh, I think it was Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, he did make an one appearance or in the two. You see the race that Adam Warlock is be- belongs to, or he's a part of. Um, she has decided to create a, a a figure the old fashioned way, and I believe that that individual is Adam Warlock. Oh, I didn't catch that. Oh, really cool. Yeah. And then one of the t- the Easter egg credit scenes at the end of that movie. Oh, nice. I'll have to go rewatch that again. Um, so his story arc that's in that's in this show, I I think. I think as dads, I think we can both relate to robot dad, someone who's caring for the kids, but also trying to walk that line between like, I want you to make these decisions for yourself, but I also want to be here for you at the same time, which is, I think is one of the hardest things about being a parent is knowing where that line is of like, what do I do for you? And what do I make? And what do I have you learn for yourself, even though it might be hard or painful? Yeah. And on top of that too, we're also in that I'm I'm in that unique perspective as well, where I've become a father, so I start to want to be a father in a way that my father wasn't. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> because I saw things that my dad did that always irritated me, and I want to do it differently to empower my kids in a different way. Yeah. And then there are the days where you slip into the same parenting techniques that you were raised yep. on. I'm and you kick you. yourself afterwards for it. <laughs> yes. And you see that so well with Red Tornado and Young Justice. So I think, to me, that's that's where the entire thing comes from. That's why Red Tornado clicks for me, because he's this parental figure for the kids there. And he, he seems to be a parental figure because... And it was so great, because it initially seems like he's just there because they didn't know what else to do with these kids. They needed to have somebody to watch over them. And so they need to have this C or D string character who doesn't sleep, who doesn't really have too much to say. And there are many instances in both TV and in comics where red tornado is just there. He's just in the background and he doesn't right. even say anything. Right. <laughs> That's like really in true. in episode six of season one of Supergirl, Red Tornado is introduced, has zero lines. Right. <laughs> He's the main <laughs> figure bad guy. He even develops his own sentience at the end. He doesn't even get to say a single word before Kara obliterates him and he's wiped off the face of the earth in in that Supergirl world. So I hated that episode. I rewatched the episode. I like it a bit more because I think that they were still doing interesting things with Red Tornado, or at least the motifs involved in Red Tornado, which yeah. all comes back to how you relate to your creator, how you relate to your father figure, because right. T.O. Morrow has just as much to do with Red Tornado as Red Tornado has to do with anything else. Yeah. After that particular arc, of course, my my head is now replaying the scene where he walks in and we see, you know, after we realize that Tio Morrow is the one that we've been seeing is an android. Right. And he comes in and sees him, you know, sick in a hospital bed. Yeah, lying there injured. And he says, he was evil, but he was my father. I will care for him. It is the human thing to do. Yeah. Oh, so good. And the way they walked a balance with him, too sometimes there's like with characters like data who I adore, there's this line that you have to walk between being human enough to be relatable and not dismissive of the audience so that the audience can, can care about the character, but not becoming too human. It's not, it's not, you know, being a, a human in an Android suit, right? It's, it's being, what does it mean to be this Android? And I think they do a really good job with red tornado, like the kids, the, uh, the kids, the team, uh, early on in the Mr. Twister episode. 
Yeah. Where they're like, oh, he's tricking us and he's doing all of this stuff. And Red Tornado's like, no, that's no, that's not a thing. <laughs> like, like, I don't, I told you what I do and this is what I do. Like, you're like, we need your help. I'm like, I've told you that's not a thing. I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not lying to you or trying to deceive you like a human would because I'm not that. I'm something else. And I think they get it across while still having like Red Tornado develop these um like like the quote basically that you brought to the beginning of the show which is brilliant yeah. right i think i understand this word but i don't know for sure i think it's this right and i think it means this and this is what i take it to mean and i'm impl- implementing it that way you know yet somehow he's still he's not too much you know keeping yeah. us at an arm's length as a, as watchers you know or the scene where where they <laughs> Zatanna's like so he doesn't eat or sleep, right? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, what does he do in that apartment? And they're all like, ah, didn't even occur to us that he's got an apartment. He's got his own apartment. Of course he does. Everyone has their own apartment. <laughs> Except he does nothing of the things that an apartment are required for. <laughs> so what no, is that? No, because he doesn't need any of those things. Right, exactly. And then to find out that it is something very personal. It is something very, uh, I hate to say human, but like something relatable, which is I am this obvious robot. Yeah. This is an android. I can pass as human and I can do things that I can't do now. It's and a very when relatable. And they infringe on his right to privacy and he comments <laughs> yeah. on that in the very robotic way to say like, if I was human, I would be chastising you is just as much to say that he is chastising them. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but for him, he's just like, okay, this is what's happening. But I don't take yeah. it personally because I have very limited emotional range. Right? I don't, I don't take it personally, but perhaps this was not the, the kindest way to act <laughs> as I have yeah. observed humans interact. And it's important because he's actually saying it. Red Tornado doesn't talk unless it's necessitated. And so right. when he's saying that, he's actually chastising them, but he doesn't really know because he doesn't have those feelings that normally provoke chastisement. He doesn't feel like his privacy has been in- invaded because he doesn't care or he is not concerned about that. He says, you have, you've broken a human tradition and a human thing. And I understand the denotative meaning of privacy. Yeah. I don't have that need because I am a robot, but should you not treat me as an individual? Should you not have treated me with the respect of one who should have that privacy? Yeah. Respecting the uh, idea that though I'm, that I'm not human, I'm sentient, and where does that line get drawn, and where does the respect level go to? You know, like, where does it Im- apply, right? And and this is something something interesting you had said earlier. There were things like, you were talking about the vision, right? The thing, the characteristics that seemed to jump out at you about the vision was, it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, because I can't remember exactly what you said, but you were like, he's honest. He follows his word. He says what he means. He means what he says. And this is also what you're reflecting on Red Tornado as well. And the same thing with Data. Data yeah. just says stuff, right? He just says what he's observing, right? And that can be a problem and that can be funny. Um, it can be, <laughs> you know, hurtful. You know what I mean? Like it can be all of these things, but there is something, or at least I think, is there something like in that level of honesty that can be comforting or draw someone to a character like that if someone was going to be in- implementing a character like this in their own novels or stories? Yeah, I feel in some ways we're all Don Quixote tilting at windmills and (laughs) we need like these these non-human characters that humans are writing are the ones who are telling him like these are that's not a monster you're facing. You're just tilting at windmills and that that to each of us can be really hard and breaking to 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 actually experience but to have these characters that are that people try to write outside the human condition trying to fit themselves within the mold of the human condition are such extremely interesting and provocative dialogues that uh, you don't get to see except in the realm of science fiction and now in superheroes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then comparing it to a character like, so vision in the movies has a, has a much wider, obvious, obviously a much wider emotional range. Now we don't, we don't get to see, we don't get to see like in both of course vision has a relationship with scarlet witch and uh red tornado is also married in the comics so he also has a wife but some of his sentience has been less in the, in young justice they imply that tio maro gave him this the level of sentience that he has 
in he's had several different origins in the DC Comics arena, including being a, being an android that was possessed by the elemental personification of air, yeah, like Ulthun. almost yeah, Ulthun. Yeah, it, well, that there, well, there's Ulthun as well, which was the Iranian tornado tyrant or something like that. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and then and then they kind of tweaked it because it's basically that. And then they tweaked it to say like, no, it wasn't on Ran. It wasn't on this this monster on Ran. It was this this uh, elemental that was supposed to be part of the manifestations of elements on the earth, like Swamp Thing, right, or Animal Man. And it was supposed to go into, I think, Tio Maro's son, but Tio Maro's son died, and he had created yep. this android, so it went into the android. It was either Tio Maro or Ivo. I've heard both, but I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be Tio Maro. I think it's only Moro. Ivo's connection to the red tornado always seems to be antagonistic. and It and seems not. to be, yeah. I've read a couple of different things in some wiki articles that mention Ivo, and I was like, I think that's not right. I think it's a typo. So he gets the sentience from something else. In in one case, he was even temporarily possessed by the original tornado, Red Tornado, who was Ma Hunkle, this this yeah. wo- a woman who was uh, a member of the Justice Society back in the day, who wore like a bucket on her head, and and is credited as like being the first heroine. Yeah, exactly. The first comics heroine, exactly. Yeah. First and she superheroine. <laughs> She had like her sentience had been dropped into this android body for a while and then they rebooted all of that again. So he's had all of these things, but a lot of them have been external forces brought into his brought into his body and not just an internal like robot level of sentience. Um, yet somehow he always seems to be presented that way. Like yeah. still an in almost an inhuman level of sentience. I don't know what his origin was supposed to be in the Justice League Unlimited series, but he in many ways was very similar to the Young Justice version of Red Tornado, where they focus more on the robotic aspect of him than other parts of his personality or or where that sentience may have come from. Yeah, in Young Justice, they make it very clear. Red Tornado says, I am a robot. John Smith is an android. And they make it very clear that he he's not, he is that one even further step removed from attempting or to be human right exactly exactly and they don't in the comics if i remember correctly he doesn't have any of the powers so it becomes interesting when you start thinking of okay if he is this elemental being that's in this robot body is it when he's transferring his mind is the end is the air elemental is this a a sentient aspect of him where does the power where is the power held you know, mm. and how does it move? Is it just him copying his mind into John Smith so he can walk around and do stuff and therefore the power is not there? Or, you know, that gets to be, for me, an interesting discussion on where this comes from. Now, if it's, if it's, he's just a ro- he's just a robot and that robot has these powers and that's what it is and he doesn't build an android with those abilities, then that makes perfect sense. But why not? Yeah. I mean, you'd think that he'd be able to, He knows how he works. He's probably one of the few people who can fix himself. I'm assuming like, you know, Steel can probably, you know, fix him. Adam, like characters who are smart and technically inclined. Yeah. Cyborg fixes him a lot in the newer editions of uh, DC DC worlds in the new 52. Yeah. So that's a thing, you know, but the, the draw of the character he just never goes away. So I guess this is what I mean when we were talking earlier about this idea that he's ubiquitous and he's even in the background. There's yeah. something about this character. There's something about this character that is important. Is important to the subconscious, if not the conscious, to put him in and say, not just like, oh, we're going to nod to Red Tornado because he's been around a long time. Yeah. I, I also think that it there there might be that, but they also like to use Red Tornado, Vision, Data, the Tin Man. They like to use these not quite human characters as a semblance of of uh, increasing tension because they can be hurt, because yeah. they can have their arms and legs ripped off, because yeah. they can have their 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 innards revealed and because they're just computational parts and electronics that's not as hard on the viewers eyes and ears as it is seeing 
you know, Superman lose an arm. And you can just put the arm back on. In Canada, we've had this commercial since the late 80s where it says, I'm Astar, I'm a robot. And he loses, he's flipping through this maze of gears and spinning saws, and he's doing a great job. And at one point he turns and he gets cut and his arm gets ripped off by a saw blade. He says, I'm Astar, I'm a robot. I can put my arm back on, you can't, so play safe. And I think that Red Tornado is also emblemic of that, that he doesn't, the the writers don't have to play safe with him. They can rip him to smithereens yeah. and just come back with Red Tornado 2.0. Yeah. In in Young Justice, he gets his arms and legs torn off. In the Justice like, League animated, so many times. In, in the Justice League animated series, he gets blown up. Like he's he's definitely he's definitely died. <laughs> he's he's put definitely through the ringer. Right. And, right. And maybe I'm just that empathetic an individual that I see this. I see this figure that is in so many ways more human than human and is trying so hard to take on the frail misconceptions that humanity has of itself to make itself that much more fit into society. And I've always been a fringe person myself. I was always looked on things from afar that I see these characters as you know, I see them as myself because they're also looking on and not quite getting it, not quite understanding it. Why are people acting the way they are? Why, why did you lie like that? That makes no sense to me. Just tell the truth. Yeah. Deal with the repercussions then. Yeah. Don't get in trouble for not telling the truth and doing the bad thing. Then you're just doubling up on the bad. <laughs> right. 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 But humans are humans. You exactly. Know? And, uh, and androids are not. Right. So. This, the, the quote unquote <laughs> simplicity of the complexity of an android, that simplicity is something we, part of our brains can easily grasp onto and hopefully get insight into ourselves about why we do or not do something. Even if it's just like, look, I did this thing, but he says it's a bad idea and he's right. It is a bad idea, but I'm doing it anyway. What is that about, right? Exactly. You you said you do you know, writing for for gaming, right? So you're writing adventures yeah. and that kind of stuff. Do you do other writing as well? I mean, being an actor, I always wonder if you, are you doing script writing, screenwriting? Do you do any of that kind of thing? Yeah, I'm of working games? on some voice actor projects uh, for an audio drama because mm-hmm. I think that everybody in our group of friends is working on their own audio drama in some I way. We have so <laughs> many projects. Yes, we do. <laughs> I, and I, I, I've limited a lot of my writing because I spend so much of my time dungeon mastering nowadays. I dungeon yeah. master Sunday afternoons for T- Tavern Tales Jr. I dungeon master Sunday evenings for regular Tavern Tales. I have a new sub podcast within Tavern Tales coming out this um, in the new year in 2019. And I also play in a, you know, every other week in a a flight risk star wars campaign which i neglected to mention earlier so i i'm doing a lot of gaming and i'm doing a lot of writing for those games because right. i like to create my own descriptions and i like to set scenes and create uh, create great character descriptions as well as come up with their voices so there's a lot of work involved with that that takes away from the actual writing no of course i totally understand that as well but i'm wondering like when you're thinking about a char- this character, this kind of character, this character trope clearly resonates with you. Absolutely. Does it come out in your, in your cre- other creative endeavors? Do you explore this, this type of thing in the characters that you create or the NPCs, the non-player characters or supporting cast that you, su- that you put into a story? Or is this something more personal for you? This is absolutely personal. But I think that a lot of the quest for honesty and the quest for yeah. truth of intention Ooh. are part of that. And that might be why I see those so thoroughly and so emblemic in those characters for me. Mm. Um, uh, Vision and Red Tornado and Data, um, because I see them struggle. Their, their struggle is so much more apparent and so much more visible than maybe like a Riker's struggle. Or in many ways, um, uh, dick's struggle or um robin's struggle Mm -hmm. right their struggles are are a little bit harder to see because they're not so immediate and they're not so apparent interesting so you incorporate the concepts of the ideas but not necessarily the trope of say the like in D &D, there is a type of sentient construct called a warforged it's not like you're playing a lot of warforged and putting them in your games to represent yeah i never i never play those sorts of characters that's not uh that's so interesting something i 
I, I, that might be that it hits too close to home. <laughs> I saw the movie Her with Scarlett Johansson and Joaquin Phoenix. Okay, I, haven't I don't know seen if that, you've no. seen it. It's 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 about artificial intelligence, and her, the Scarlett Johansson character, is essentially starts out as an artificial AI that is on your phone and becomes like a personal secretary and personal assistant. Okay, but it grows as and changes based upon your needs. It'll go through all of your emails that you've kept through all of history and all of your search files that you've done on your internet browsing and everything you've bought online and all of the things that it has access to. It can, if you give it permission, will go and do those things and it'll personalize itself to you based on the conversations you have with people. And Joaquin Phoenix's character falls in love with her her over the course of the movie. But it's also about how sentient artificial intelligence is not human intelligence. It moves faster. The processing speed is quicker. So it always gives me the pause, like, how much does Red Tornado have to slow down his thought processes and his computational um, abilities in order to just interact with the Justice League? Because Tio Moro has given these sentient artificial intelligent figures such powers and such capability of thought that they can be almost human, that they process things so, so much more quickly than you or I do with our, you know, our chemical electro, electro brains. Right. I kind of wonder as to that. And the movie Her really reflects for me in the same semblance as all of these other pieces. So it's that line between whatever you define as quote unquote humanity or sapience and the illusion of sapience and yeah. where does that line get crossed like when when can how can you tell like when something that looks or acts sapient is sapient yeah that's true that's a good way to put it interesting and and the other thing that's interesting for me as well is um red tornado was created to infiltrate the justice the society in the 1940s yes and he's the same I think technology's moved forward a little bit. So I've always yeah. thought I've always thought about like has he been rebuilt? He's not more streamlined. He doesn't he looks almost exactly the same. We've seen a photo of him joining the Justice Society in the 40s, but his body looks the same. Like is his I mean cuz he says at one point like in the in the finale he's like, "Oh, there was, you know, I can't remember what it was, you know, 0. 0.016 milliseconds to take effect and I was able to write a subroutine." to disconnect my power core if I tried to infect someone else. Like he processed what it was, what was happening to him, what was going on, how to counter yeah. it, write a program, write a, write a subroutine and get that implemented in that period of time. Yes. Get himself out of the red tornado body, put himself into the John Smith body so that right. he wasn't controlled by, Oh, I can't remember the bad guy's name. You would oh, know it. Savage. Is yes. that what you're talking about? Right. Yeah. So, so being able to at least shut down his power, like he's like, I can't do anything else, but I can shut down my power core so that I don't infect somebody else, but I have no power beyond that. From a writing standpoint, it's genius because it, it really puts the, uh, onus, the focus on the anti or the protagonist of the show, which are the, which are the teenagers. Yep. Right. So, it re you know, Red Tornado's like, oh no, I'm working at full capacity, my own full personal capacity. I'm not, I'm not being written badly so that the teenagers can do well. I did something crazy talk, right, about yeah. like my own programming, but I only but I only had a limited thing. Like that's thinking that's thinking a little deeper as a writer and saying like, oh, okay, this makes sense. We can shut him down, but he can't turn himself back on because he can't fix himself. Exactly. And, you, and so you know, you move forward into that. But how his brain works and what evolution has happened with him over time, I would love to talk to Greg or Brandon and about this particular aspect of Red Tornado. Find out what they think has happened inside because clearly computers were not working in the 1940s the way they work now so well, yeah when he debuted in 1968 i don't think there was such a thing as a subroutine <laughs> as of yet so <laughs> i'm guessing <laughs> yeah and what's great is the debut of of so many of these characters you kind of wonder what was going on in back rooms and coffee shops and where these writers were meeting and chatting and whatnot because red tornado debuts in august of 1968 yeah Vision debuts in October of 1968. Yep. And 
some may say, oh, they saw that, then they quickly created a character. Well, no, they didn't, because usually there was a two to three month gap between yep. when something was already written to be to be penciled, to be drawn, to be inked, to be put together, to be published, to be put out into the market, into the mass. There was no way that the, they could have seen a picture of of the vision, or sorry, of Red Tornado. And then replace that with, you know, oh, we should create the same character, but they have the same, same cape, same cowl, same red face. Like, yeah, there is something to be said, like, you're like, ah, they just duplicating each other. But some of these come so close. Um, uh, Niles Calder, who is the, who is the wheelchair bound chief of the Doom Patrol and yep. Professor X, the wheelchair bound leader of the X, X-Men came out like months apart. And Calder has like a full beard, mustache, and, and long hair. Yep. And Professor Xavier's totally bald. Like those are the only yep. things, like the only differences between the two of these characters, besides their actual personalities. But still, like visually, it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> what do you? Did you guys? Is this part of the zeitgeist? Like a this part of this like cultural, you know, uh, community of creation? We're all kind of hitting on some similar notes in different ways, just because of the way that that news happened to be at the time or, you know, the way people were raised or way people were interacting at the time that just kind of like had these parallels or is it, you know, like you have like, Oh, okay, well we've got deep impact and whatever that terrible asteroid movie was with Bruce Willis (laughs) coming out with Bruce Willis and Ben Affleck uh, in in the same year. Yep. (laughs) And and you're like, Oh, I guess it's time for asteroids hitting the earth movies. Yeah. Or, or did one of them, did somebody hear? I, I don't know what it was. Like, oh, so they're doing one, so we have to do one? That just seems like a terrible way to go. Like, It also seems really implausible, too. So implausible. Because, yeah. Because so many of those things are kept so close to the chest, they don't want to reveal that. And even if the 60s, it was a different time, this, the likelihood of that happening is so irregular. And the other one that I always bring up is A Bug's Life and Ants. Yeah. Like, because those came out almost the same summer, and those take, years to develop and produce yeah it's animation and of course of course yeah absolutely Uh, i i agree with you on that front but there is definitely still this thing like this this trope that we're talking about this this android trope this look at human nature trope that just won't it won't go away no and i don't think it should go away because it's it's a perfect kind of uh, representation of us taking a look at ourselves from a different perspective yeah right so we're going to see more and um Oh gosh, what's his name from Bishop from Aliens as well? Like that, the android aspects of science hey, fiction yeah, in general, for sure. right? Uh, represent those same things. And so I think I want to wrap this up a little bit. If there's any final notes or observations you want to make about Red Tornado as a character within Young Justice, why that you've already touched on why it's kind of personal to you in these ideas and aspects of Red Tornado. What do you what do you want to do you want to see something in particular in season three and beyond with Red Tornado? I'd like to see more John Smith and Kathy Sutton. Yeah. I'd like to see that that step from him being the superhero yeah. to being the android to the, the closer step to humanity that he wants to take. He doesn't have to be the caretaker of the kids anymore. They've got older kids taking care of the younger kids, which I think is really great. And I think that that's where that's going to go. And I think his storyline has largely been written and written very well because they introduced him and I thought, okay, he's just a, he's just easily put there as a placeholder. Somebody has got to watch these kids because we don't want fans writing into us to say, these kids are all alone in this cave. Nobody's even watching them. Batman doesn't seem to care. Batman's like, however you solve the problem, you solve the problem. As long as you solve the problem. By the way, solve the problem. Right. Um, and that's Batman's way of parenting. <laughs> Figure it out yourself. Um, which is, I, 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 I embody that. You know, kids got to learn to fail on their own and pick themselves up. Uh, but I think it has to do with the, the graphic novel of Red Tornado that came out in 2010. Mm. Because I think that there were some really wonderful moments that were written into that. And when I picked that up after having already seen Young Justice, I thought that Red Tornado Family Reunion was going to be that same sort of storyline I saw in Young Justice, which is the reason why Red Tornado was there, because there's that like almost three episode arc where you think he's in the league. There are red robots attacking the the team, attacking yeah. the, the cave and and. It, it's so fraught because 
that's where the real relationship with his father comes in with Red Tornado. And that's where this relationship with these siblings that he did slash and didn't know about, who all had their own existences as well, comes up. And in Family Reunion, it's almost ruined um, as a graphic novel. It's so quick to jump to the conflict, to the exploration of powers being done by these elemental robots Mm. that it takes away from that quest for humanity that I thought was so important in Red Tornado because Red Volcano is the opposite. He's like, I am better than human. I don't know why you strive to be human. Let's be better than them and rule over them. Right, right. We got to stop that. Got to lose our legs and stop that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly exactly all right well thank you so much for joining us kyle to talk about oh, it's been great my favorite android in the dc universe um where can people find you out you like uh, him more than brainiac do i like red tornado more than brainiac yeah man that's like a trick question do you like him more than blue beetle well he's not a really an android well I, i'm not referring to the you know the mask that blue beetle wears of <laughs> oh you mean the scarab <laughs> <laughs> i mean the scarab itself blue beetle oh, the scarab interesting see now you're asking the hard qu- hey this is my show you're I know, asking me sorry. the hard questions <laughs> the hard questions say oh no i love brainiac i love i love how he does what he does no that's terrible it's a terrible thing to say um <laughs> now i'm going to be thinking about this all day Thank you, Kyle. This is, I appreciate this is stuff that. that we should all be thinking about. <laughs> SAI and AAI is coming. We need to figure out rules by which we will exist and work with it. That should be the final thing I say. For me, Red Tornado is the cat's pajamas. I think I like him more than Vision now, which is saying so much because I wow. have figurines of Vision. So That's a bold statement. All right. On that positive note, where can people find you out on Earth Prime? Uh, when you're looking for me, look for me at www.taverntales.ca. That's where the majority of my creative impetus is going. You can follow me on Twitter at TavernTalesDM, and you can uh, check out my podcast, which is found wherever podcasts can be found. Awesome. Thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode on tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com on our website crashingthemode.com and our email address whelmedpodcast at gmail.com you can also find us on youtube stitcher and iHeartRadio. if you enjoy our show please consider sharing it with a friend you can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on apple podcasts or your podcatcher of choice the ratings help others find the show If you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to dig around a little harder to find those. Please continue, of course, to spread the word to friends and family about this amazing show and get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere coming in just a few weeks. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.